Welcome to BIV Today, the daily podcast from the newsroom of Business in Vancouver. I'm Kurt LaPointe, publisher and editor-in-chief. You know, in February 2020, my guest was guarding one of football's marquee quarterbacks and opening holes for running backs and participating in the victorious Super Bowl for the Kansas City Chiefs. Laurent Duvernay-Tardif grew up in Montreal, played football for McGill, and was only the fourth medical graduate to ever play in the NFL. He is, of course, Dr. Duvernay-Tardif. Months later, in the first couple of waves of the pandemic, he made what many considered an extraordinary choice. He set aside his football career for a while at its peak to minister to the medical needs of Quebecers who were stricken with the coronavirus in the long-term care facility. He, he ministered to them there. Uh, he sat out the year, and he was the first NFLer to decide to do so. He was subsequently honored, as he should have been, I think, as the Lou Marsh Athlete of the Year in Canada, and with the ESPN Muhammad Ali Sports Humanitarian Award. He, he is connected now with Sodexo Canada as a brand ambassador to talk to youth about the value of physical activity and healthy eating. And he's here in Vancouver to bring this message, and we're fortunate he has time for us today. Good to see you. Hey, good morning. Yeah, your, your choice at that crucial stage of a career, um, some would say went against a bit of a grain with our value system about how we, we lionize uh, athletes and all that. Um, tell me a bit about what you had to contend with in the way of, of what are at times, I think, conflicting elements of your identity in this one. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, opting out of the 2020 season was uh, for sure the, the hardest decision of my life. Um, after the Super Bowl, uh, the pandemic hit, and, and I remember, uh, you know, on March 12th, uh, the, the Quebec government uh, asking for people to go back and help in long-term care facility. And to me, it was a little bit of a nonsense because I, I had the medical background. And, and at some point, I felt like, you know, who am I to stay on my balcony and work out to go play a game called football when there's actually a world sanitary crisis going on out there? And so I respond mm -hmm to the call and, and it was it, it was kind of a chaotic environment but it was also really nice to see people coming together like I was part of a movement of thousands of healthcare professional that went back and helped retired doctor and nurses and, and that's kind of um, uh, th that experience those 10 week on the front line that that kind of fed my decision uh, in July of that year to decide to opt out because uh, I know I'm going to be part of the medical community for the next 30 years. And, and at some point it was important for me to be able to look at myself in the mirror and tell myself, like, I follow my conviction. Uh, and, and, and the same way I was, I was, you know, leaving a team, my team in Kansas city. Uh, I also felt like, you know, if I would have gone back to Kansas city, I would have left the team uh, that I've been working with on the, on the front line uh, for 10 weeks uh, during the off season. So it, it was just, it, it was a tough decision, but I, I really don't regret it. You know, I feel like um, working in, in such a, a difficult time in the medical community, uh, you, you learn what's really important. You know, I've been in contact with patients that haven't seen their family for two months. Uh, and, and at some point you realize that, okay, well, it's one thing to try to treat at all costs, but is it, isn't it more important just to, to show comfort, to show dignity, to work as a team, to show empathy, uh, so the difference between like treating at all costs and caring for somebody, uh, that's that's really what I learned throughout this process. And I really do think that it's going to make me a better physician down the road. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask about how you feel you learned things about yourself in all of this. Uh, you learn quite a bit about yourself, that's for sure. You know, the, the same way. Uh, when you got to dig deep on a football field because it's third and 15 and you got to convert in order to win the game, um, wor working on the front line of a pandemic, it's like a, it's a totally different mindset, but it's, it's, it's another environment where you got to push yourself, where you got to work as a team. And, and for me, when I first went in there, I, I really went in there with uh, the mindset of a medical student, trying to optimize everything and, and trying to like, you know, put aside my, my, my football status. But, but I was like two months ago, I was in Miami winning the Super Bowl. So, so it was hard to do so. Like people were looking up to me in a different way. Like I was, I was not just an orderly or a nurse, you know, and, and, and at some point I realized that there's a way where you can embrace both role at the same time. And, and the same way, like patient needs 
attention and, and people to like take care of them and cheer them on. Like the medical staff also needed uh, some joy and excitement. And so uh, I felt like yeah. I had kind of a dual role to all, to the, throughout the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the long-term care facilities because that is of course where we had the most shocking early results of the coronavirus. And you, you were a young physician. This, I can't imagine that this was something that you were expecting so early. How, you know, what do you think we've learned about that piece of the coronavirus and, and what our long-term care facilities are like? Uh, you know what? In medical school, you're, you're not really exposed to long-term care facility. And, and to be honest, it's a really different environment than the hospital setting where, where people usually go back home, you know, and, and you cure them, you treat them, uh, they get back on their feet. A uh, long-term care facility is really like a, a live, like a, a, it's, it's an environment of, of its home. Like people are not going back home and it's not like when you think about, okay, I want to do as much good as I can. It, it's not really in terms of like adjusting blood pressure medication. It's more in terms of like basic human need and thing that sometimes we take for granted, especially through a pandemic, like uh, taking a bath, uh, uh, you know, having three warm meals a day like those simple thing i think became crucial at some point in 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 the course of the pandemic because we were so short staff that it was hard to provide those basic you know human rights to a certain extent and and uh that it really gives you another perspective on on the whole medical uh and the healthcare system in general and, and you know sometimes we take decision at the macro level that we think are the best for the the general population. But um, when when you're inside those long-term care facility and you got to work with those different decision and they don't make sense on the floor, it's uh, it becomes tricky, you know, and and the resilience of all those uh, healthcare workers that I've been working with have been just straight up amazing throughout this pandemic. Like I, I couldn't be more proud um, of the team that I've worked with. And even though I went back to Kansas City this last season, I still remain in contact with those people because uh, it's like playing on the football field. Like you, you, because of what you went through, you you build connection with with those people, and and they're gonna stay friends for the for the rest of my life. Yeah, you know, this this is a, an ordeal that is once in a lifetime. Uh, one hopes, right? And one hopes. Um, uh, does it worry you a bit when you take a look at what happened in in these facilities? Um, across Canada, not just uh, not just in Quebec. Um, does it worry you about the future of, of how, you know, how we treat and how we deal with with those that are in elderly care in this country? Yes, because I was I was not aware of a lot of things that were going on in long term care facility um, in in a in a good time. So so what I've experienced is is of course once in a lifetime. We hope. Uh, but but it's still there's still something I think we, we got to ask ourselves some question about how we value uh, the, like all those elder, elderly patients uh, that have worked so hard and contribute so much to our society. Uh, how, how do we how do we value their their, their, their quality of life? Uh, and I, I think I think there's really well, hopefully the, this pandemic is going to be kind of a wake up call and, and we're going to be able to ask ourselves those type of question, you know, same, same is true with, with, with primary prevention at, at the youth level. Like um, we cannot focus only on, on treating people with diabetes, hypertension, uh, dyslipidemia uh, that are, you know, 30 to 70. We got we to gotta prevent that from happening in the first place by uh, doing primary prevention and, and promoting healthy lifestyle at the youth level. And we got to also take care of the the elderly to make sure that they stay physically active so they don't have to go too young in those those long-term care facilities so i think there's a lot that can be done uh and, and at the end of the day all those little measures are gonna not only be cost effective i think for the the healthcare system in general but they're also going to promote a better quality of life for the patients yeah, I want to talk to you in a, in a minute about uh, your your work now with youth because it is very important, and I think it's an extension of of your dual identities, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, but I want to ask, what do you think football teaches you about being a doctor, and what does being a doctor teach you about 
football. Mm. A, a lot, that's for sure. Uh, you know what? I, I, there's no doubt in my mind that I, I was a better football player because I had medicine uh, on the sideline, you know, and not necessarily because of the the connection when it comes to like learning the playbook and all that stuff, but just from a um, like coping with the anxiety and the pressure related to play, playing professional sports, like to have other anchors in different sphere, I think help you cope better with that, that pressure. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and same thing is, is true with medicine. Like when you're on the football field, I was joking earlier about being in a third and 15th situation. You got to convert. There's 80,000 people in the stands. Um, you, you cannot let your emotion get the best out of you. You got to be able to be rational, irrational, you know, and, and make logical and, uh, decision in a stressful environment. And that's kind of uh, also true in medicine. Like you're working in the emergency room, like you cannot get distracted by people yelling the tension and all like, you got to focus on airway, breathing, circulation, vital sign. Like you, you gotta have a, um, a kind of an, an algorithm in your mind, the same way when you're on a football field, you gotta be like, all right, the defense, the defense is presenting cover two. There's 50% chance they're going to blitz. And you got to be able to think in those terms if you want to have success. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of similarity between football and medicine. Does it, uh, does it help you in dealing with failure? Is fa- failure is, you know, is unfortunately part of, part of what's being a doctor, right? For sure. Uh, and that's, I, I think that's why I try so much to promote, you know, being active at, at a youth level and, and playing team sports because uh, no matter how good you are, uh, 50% of the people are going to lose the game. And, and learning how to lose is a critical way. It, it, it's, a, it's so important. Uh, and it's a skill set that you can use in life in general, but especially in medicine where, of course, like um, you, you're not always winning against the diseases and, and especially not against COVID. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about uh, you turning some attention now to helping young people with their uh, with their physical activity, with their choices, their lifestyle choices, their their eating choices, of course, as part of this work that you're doing with Sodexo. Um, what's your perception about the generation that's following you now? I mean, I, you know, it's, it gets stereotyped in not very pleasant ways now uh, about, you know, being obsessed with the screen and uh, you know, and not having physical play as part of a childhood, in the same way, um, schools have very, very much cut programs that have emphasized the joy of physical activity. You know, the the way it can rescue a lot of people uh, from from real difficulties. Mm-hmm. Um, give me your take uh, as as someone who actually now can talk not only as a professional athlete but someone who is a medical professional and can see this trend line well, and maybe not be all that happy with it. It's interesting because, you know, the same way, yes, I, I do have a, a different perspective. Maybe uh, at the same time, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not even 31. So <laughs> I feel like I, I'm still pretty close to that generation that you're just talking about. But, but I, I think you're right. Like, especially um, as we went through this pandemic, like, um, the school shut down, uh, working, you no know, learning math on, on, on an iPad. It, it, like it's, there's so many things that I think, uh, disconnected people from the human interaction, the social skills that you need in life. And when I think about school, I think about way more than just having A's and maths and, and B and English. Like it's, it, it's about learning how to win, learning how to lose, learning how to interact with people, that think differently than you are and how to cope with that, how to show empathy. Like that's to me, those skill sets uh, translate potentially even more to the real world than the actual grades that you, you get in high school. So um, Mm -hmm. I I think it's tremendous. It's really important uh, that, that we, that we recreate uh, an environment that is stimulating for our youth in the school environment, you know, And, and, and like, extracurricular activity, sports, arts, nutrition, like those are all, I think, sphere where we can get better at. And that's, that's why I want to get involved is because I, I think through uh, good, um, like healthy behavior, good nutrition, uh, being active, you can, you can create an environment where kids are going to want to go 
uh, to school and, and they're going to enjoy the, the process and, and it's going to make them better student, but it's also going to make them better human. Yeah. But, 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 you know, full well, I mean, these things are, uh, you know, are, are kind of like this generation cigarette package, right? I mean, you're, you're always reaching in, you're always, I, mean, I, I want to know how, how it is that you, um, you're trying to retrieve uh, a little bit of that old um, approach of, of school being this uh, focal point of, of life skills development um, when we have really spent two years bottling it all up and packing it into, uh, you know, into Zoom classes and masked, uh, you know, masked encounters and things and reducing the amount of interplay for fear of spreading this horrible virus. I mean, you know, you're at an interesting juncture here, aren't you? Where this is the time yeah. to retrieve for sure, and, and and we cannot wait. Like we gotta, we gotta invest uh, in in our youth. We gotta invest in school programs that are gonna be adapted to the new reality of kids. Uh, and and when you look at you know all the consequences of the pandemic, I think we've only seen the tip of the iceberg when it comes to anxiety and depression at, at the youth level. Like we, I think we gotta be proactive. And you're talking about the cell phone. Like what I keep telling the kid when I meet with them is like if you want to make sure you're not touching your phone, play soccer, you know, play football. You cannot be on your phone when you do sports, you know, and, and that, that period of time where you disconnect from the virtual world in order to focus a hundred percent of your attention on something that's real in front of you. It, it's so important. Like I'm, I'm a little bit on the hyperactive side, you know, but, and I know how much sports help me, you know, from a, from an endocrine level with the endorphin rush to help me focus better in the classroom, uh, to the social interaction, to the feeling of like pushing my own personal limit to accomplish more. Like sport brought me so much more than just the notoriety of being an NFL Super Bowl champion. And that's, that's really my message, uh, to, to the kids out there. And it sounds to me and, and in examining a little bit about your life too, that, you know, you, you obviously struck a balance pretty early in your life. You, you, the aggression that comes naturally with playing sport, the competitiveness about it, also had a grounding here in medical practice. You, you can't, can't help but have it. So how do you then uh, portray this to young people who see you, you know, six foot five, big strapping guy, you know, no way I'm going to try to get past you. Uh, to to also say you know there is you know it's not just physical it's there's something emotional that you have to deal with and and you know there are consequences when you don't absolutely and you mentioned the word balance and for me that's that's at the essence of what I'm trying to do like and I know it's a little bit paradoxical because. I try to perform and compete at the highest level in my sports and 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 in the and, and in the medical world as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, I feel like combining both and trying to reach some sort of balance, uh, optimize your performance in each sphere. You know, and and I feel like uh, we're getting we're in a society where you got to know more and more about a smaller and smaller field of expertise. You know. And, and and it's fine, but having other anchor in different places, I think, really helps you better manage your emotion. Uh, because when it doesn't go well in football, if you only define yourself as a football player, how can you how can how can, how can you rebound? Uh, in, in like it's it's impossible, you know. And, and that's why we we also see so many. Uh, anxiety issues and, and, and post-career issue uh, in, in the football community. Um, I, I think having strong plan B, and that's why I keep telling, you know, student athletes that all see themselves as professional athletes one day uh, and, and enjoy and embrace and realize how privileged you are to have that opportunity to do both. And, and, and yes, you, you can try to get to the professional level, but at the end of the day, you're always – one play away to get injured, to retire, to get cut because of salary cap issue. Uh, and what's going to be left for you for the next 40 years, it, it's what you're studying right now. And, and that's why I think 
striking for that balance between academics, between arts, between sports, um, really, I think it really helps you being a more complete human. And, and it's not necessarily to try to strike for the NFL or strike for medical school. Um, it, it's it's to shoot for something that means everything to you, like your own passion. If it's violent, it's violent. If it's theater, it's theater. And, and it doesn't really matter how big the thing is. The, the, the project is uh, objectively it's it's what it matters it, it how much it mattered to you subjectively and that's really what makes the difference I think yeah that's very interesting uh, the one thing that's very clear though is that in in both of your um, your identities if you want to call them that I mean you are really right at the edge like you 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 know the, like you, you are, you know, you are this like football player that's right at the top of a game and, and you're a doctor that's right at the top of a game here. Um, do you take a look sometimes at your, at your football brethren and, and go, you know, gee, I, 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 it's, it's so, it's kind of sad to see that you put the eggs in this one basket and not thought about the other basket that's going to follow this career and, Keep you know, and and you'll have to deal with for the next sixty years of your life. Yeah, yeah, but at the same time, who am I to judge? Like uh, everybody's come is coming from different background. Um, I feel like I was really privileged growing up because I had two parents that were there, not to push me, but to always make me feel like I had the safety net right behind uh, me that allow me to yeah. like strike for one more step. You know, and and it's not like that for everybody. So. I feel like it's it's hard to it's hard it's hard to judge and, and you know everybody have their own recipe of what works for them. I think my message is more take the time to ask yourself the question uh, and, and then make the decision that's right for you. Like I, I don't pretend to have a special recipe for anything. I think it's more um, this idea of of being aware of your emotion, of being aware of the different possibility that are presented to you, uh, of the consequences of what happened if, you know, your, your sports or your passion is taken away from you because of an injury or whatever. Like it's more uh, to raise awareness and ask yourself the question and also removing the stigma from talking about your emotion, you know, and how you're feeling. And, and uh, I, I think this is more my message than, Oh, push, push, but also be balanced, but also be this. Like it's, I feel like if I stick, to, if I only talk about that, my message is kind of paradoxical to some extent because I promote performance, but at the same time balance. But it's, I, I think it's more to be self-conscious of what works for you, asking yourself the right question. Yeah, I'm sure the uh, young people that are talking to you, of course, are dealing with their own many issues, uh, whether it's family of origin issues, uh, um, their own, uh, their own sense of loneliness or, or, you know, dissatisfaction and all of that. And I wonder whether now you feel at long last in the realm of professional sport, we're finally beginning to see the different dimension to the athlete, uh, around mental health and around the challenges of that and the coping skills or lack thereof at, at times. Um, whether you see that as, as at last we're, we're kind of taking the veil of invincibility off the professional athlete in a healthy way. Uh, yeah, in a really healthy way. And, and, you know, when I started in Kansas City uh, in 2014, that's not that long ago, uh, there was no such thing as, as a sports psychologist on staff with the team. And now here we are seven, eight years later and, and more than half of the team in the NFL have sports psychologists on, on staff, you know, and I used to be looked at as a different type of player because I was seeing my sports psychologist once a week. Uh, <laughs> and, and now it's like part of, part of the routine of an, a normal athlete. And I think there's a lot of good to that because whether we want it or not, uh, we are like we have a microphone in our hand because of what we do for a living. And, and we have that responsibility uh, and that, that ability to inspire and, and to influence how, you know, sports is, is being practiced at a, at a youth level. And, and I think it's uh, it's it's great, you know, and we got to we got to embrace that responsibility. And every every guys that I've played with uh 
in one way or another is using that platform to promote something that they believe in, you know, whether it's the, the right to vote movement during the 2016 election or I don't know, uh, anyway, uh, yeah. or, or the 2020 election uh, or, or the racial inequality movement. And, and for me, like my my calling is, is promoting health and a healthy lifestyle. So I, I'm, that's why that's why I partner up with Sodexo. That's why I have my own foundation to try to promote balance between education, sports and, and creation. Um, and, and I think that's, um, at the end of the day that, that has to become to some extent your purpose Like, yes, you want to be the best athlete on the field, but what's going to be left of you, uh, when you're done playing, you know, yeah. and, and that's, it's, yeah. but it sounds as if you've, uh, you've got your, you, you've got the outline of a plan, right? You, you've, uh, you've thought about the post playing time. I mean, uh, you know, football players don't get to do this when they're 65 years old anymore. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you. Although it would be kind of a lot of, it would be fun to watch. Unless you're Tom Brady, I think, who knows how long he'll go. Um, but, uh, but but what I, so, so last piece on this one, because um, it's such an interesting conversation, I could ask you questions for hours, but um, a couple of things. Is Colin Kaepernick gonna get a job again in football? Wow. Uh, I was not expecting this one. Uh, I don't know how to judge uh, the athletic ability of a quarterback, so I don't know. But I hope that if he's good enough to play, he's going to get a job. That's all I can. Like, to me, so many things have changed in football uh, since uh, Kaepernick was, you know, on the football field, putting a knee during the national anthem that – I hope that, you know, the NFL is doing so much to promote the fact that they're more open, that, that they're fa fighting uh, uh, ra racial inequality and racism. I, I hope that if he's good enough to play, he's going to be able to get a job. Yeah, because some of the young people you would be dealing with would be looking for also the, the kind of uh, congruence, you know, with, with obviously with your life and with the institution you've been a part of and, and would likely say, well, you know, that institution is still still kind of in some challenge here, you know, in all of this, you know, you, you, you know, it's not, not kind of solved this one yet for itself uh, and all that. Um, hey, are you, uh, are you going to be back on the field or, you know, are you, you're a free agent now, aren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I've been. Uh, I think free agency started like ten days ago, um, and it's uh, it's interesting because I, I I've been in the NFL for eight years now, and I'm probably one of the only player who got drafted, signed an extension, uh, was on the IR because of an injury, got traded, opted out, and now is a free agent. So I've been through pretty much all the possible uh, contractual <laughs> scenario <laughs> there is. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's just different right now because, um, you know, offers are on the table. I'm, I'm, but I'm, I'm kind of like waiting for the right one. If there's one, I, I don't even know if the right one's going to show up, but I'm, I'm not in a rush. You know, I, I every year that I play football, it, it's getting harder and harder for me to transition towards medicine afterwards. So I feel like yeah. I got to ask myself the right, the right question. And also from a physical standpoint, like how do I feel, uh, so I'm I'm in the process of like thinking about this uh, in Vancouver as I'm going to like talk to kids. But I, I think it's the best way. Like taking your mind off football is the best way to actually give you give you a, a perspective on on football and and what a football season look like and what type of toll does it take on you and that kind of stuff. I think the LOS could use you right now, but uh, never mind. We'll we'll leave that one alone. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so tell me, uh, as we, as we conclude, um, what's the most interesting question that you get asked by, by children now? That's a really good one. Some, sometimes like when you talk to like, you know, that, that age group between like eight and 12, uh, you, you get, you get the most, um, uh, uh, the, the most profound question are often like the, the more, the, the simpler one, you know, because they don't have, they don't know exactly what the NFL is. They don't know exactly what it represents in the, in, in the sport community, but just in the, you know, in, in our society, how big of a place it, 
it holds. And they don't, have in, filter, they don't have a filter, right? They, don't, they have no filter. No, exactly. And they just ask you, like, why? You know, just, <laughs> and you're like, well, because it's the NFL. And you're like, but why? And, and like, sometimes <laughs> those simple questions, you do think a, about it a lot at night. But, uh, yeah, honestly, every time I go to, to a school and I have a good conversation with kids, I, I feel like I'm, I grow as a as a human. It makes me reflect. It's 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 almost like having a, a sports psychology session, uh, <laughs> because because you, you 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 cannot take anything for granted. And 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 you're meeting with kids that have no clue what football is, that don't want to be doctors, that that don't want to go to school, and 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 you talk with them, and and you realize that there's there's thousands of different, you know, potential paths that you can take in your development. And what really matter at the end of the day is to be passionate about what you're doing, you know, and, yeah. and, and we got to We got to try to provide them, you know, that structure and that guidance and that safety net that we were talking about so that they can, they can strive for uh, what they think is their ultimate path. That's all we can do. Yeah. Well, you know, sounds like you're uh, pursuing such a, a really strong path, you know, the, the grounding that you've had uh, from being raised, uh, you know, with, with supportive parents and in a, in a good environment, a good, in a good community uh, has, has uh, done you well. Um, so best wishes, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, a great thing that you're doing and, uh, you know, get back on the field, I suppose, but, you probably don't feel like you have to, do you? I feel like I, I'm in a position to do whatever makes me happy at this point, to be honest. And my mom always told me, like, try to open as many doors as possible. And uh, and I feel like now, slowly but surely, I'm going to have to maybe close a couple in the next few years. But I'm, I'm totally comfortable with that because at the end of the day, they're all great opportunities. Uh, so it's just a matter of, like, what do I want to do? Yeah. Well, yeah. good luck. Good luck with your choices. Thank you so much, you, made, Kirk. you made some very good ones so far. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank today. you. I'm Kirk LaPointe, publisher and editor in chief of BIB. Thanks a lot for watching.